Hello and welcome to Working Scientist, a Nature Careers podcast. I'm Julie Gould. This is the fifth episode of a series called The Last Few Miles, planning for the late stage career in science. What we've learned so far in this series is that a lot of the later stages of an academic career is preparing for that next transition, going from employed to retired. And one aspect of this later stage of an academic career that is specific to scientists in academia, not all, I know, but some, is that those who head up and manage a lab need to prepare for what happens to the lab when they retire. And this preparation won't be the same for everyone as everybody's lab has different things in it. So in this episode, I'm going to share a few examples of how people have handed over their lab and what, if any, preparation they've done towards this. In Argentina, and particularly in the physics community, labs are handed over to someone specific. Someone that has been part of a lab already and has been trained up to take on the reins. So part of preparing for retirement from an Argentinian physics lab is, as we heard Maria Teresa Dova, a physics professor at the University of La Plata in Argentina, say in the first episode of this series, is to make sure you've got your legacy ready to hand over. I always try to train my younger researchers to do all the things I'm doing. I always say this is my legacy, but what about my legacy if nobody will continue that? You know, so it's important to uh, to be sure that uh, there will be a continuation, a smooth continuation. Maria Teresa told me that in the case where a lab only has one PI and that PI leaves suddenly due to forced retirement, whatever the reason, then the laboratory merges with another one. But in general, she told me there isn't a single PI in a lab. She told me over email that they have, and I quote, a fairly horizontal organisation where we, PIs, train others to ensure continuity. Additionally, labs often rejuvenate with new lines of research. Carlos Garcia Canal, Professor Emeritus at the University of La Plata in Argentina, handed over his physics laboratory a few years before he retired. And he did this because he felt it was important to give the younger generations a chance to take the lead whilst he was still around to help. I have uh, confidence that the, the the younger people in my group were able to go ahead with the projects, with the responsibility and with the bureaucracy that, you know, with uh, a scientific project have some bureaucracy behind. And so I, I was certain that they can go ahead with that. And I was ready to help them as soon as they need me, you know, that, that's clear. This actually worked out well for Carlos too, because now, 15 years later, he is still involved in doing research in this lab and he continues to help where he can. They thought that perhaps maintaining me in activity was useful for them to go ahead with their own careers because uh, I, I have a lot of uh, a lot of relationships with people abroad. Uh, I have uh, many contacts uh, in Spain, in the United States, in France, in, in Germany, etc. So for them, it's also useful to have some people that connect them with, uh, with abroad, with the other uh, institutions uh, of research, for example, with CERN, etc., Vincent Soutin, a professor of pharmacology at the University of Liège in Belgium, told me that in Belgium, the equipment that has been purchased by a researcher whilst working at a university becomes the property of that university, which means that the retiring academic has no say on how his or her succession will be organised. It will be handed to somebody else. I still don't know exactly who, uh, but since, uh, you know, I'm on a platform of uh, what is called the Giga Neuroscience. So we are doing molecular and cellular neuroscience research. Uh, there is a, a, a wish uh, by many of my colleagues to have the electrophysiology platform still running for, for a number of projects. Yeah, so it, it won't be uh, broken down, uh, especially, you know, since um, uh, Belgium is not very, very good at uh, funding research. <laughs> And we have uh, in electrophysiology in Patch Camp, we have what we call setups. And, and these, these are rather 
uh, expensive uh, machines and uh, it, it would be a, a disaster to, uh, to get rid of them. In the United States of America, it's different again. When a PI retires from lab research, the lab and sometimes the particular direction of research that that lab has taken gets shut down and the space gets handed over to someone else. Roberto Coulter, a professor emeritus at Harvard Medical School in the USA, managed this when he retired and closed his lab in the latter half of 2018. And it took five years of planning. In going emeritus in the American system, uh, your lab basically closes and that line of research closes. And, and then they, the department may be given the position again or not. Some departments don't don't continue it. So, and compared to Europe where there's a tendency to keep the lab open and have it replaced, but the theme remains more or less, that doesn't really happen. So the United States, is, it doesn't have that. So it's not unusual when somebody retires that that line of investigation at that institution Ends. That meant that his lab was not going to be handed to a postdoc or a successor that Roberto had chosen. It was out of his control. But this wasn't the only reason why Roberto decided to retire and close his lab. I saw philosophically that uh, the system is not that sustainable if we stay forever training people forever. So the concept of the numbers. And, and uh, I was glad to see other people... Uh, thinking along the same way that one wants to make room for the younger people to carry on with the active research, getting the grant monies, etc. So let's talk about some of the processes that go on sort of behind the scenes when it comes to closing down a lab. So you already said that you planned it well in advance. So at the time we spoke, you said you had a, you went, it was when it came to renewing grant funding, it was far, you had to think about it five years in advance. So if you were speaking to an early or mid-career researcher and they were asking you like, okay, how do I go about closing my lab? How do I do this if I want to retire? Um, can you talk them through some of the sort of the how-to steps uh, on how to do yes, it? Yes, yes. I, I think for me, the, the, the key point and the one that I would recommend is that uh, a huge factor of what research is about is training individuals. Uh, to me, that's that was what made... Uh, the work so much fun is not so much, I mean, yes, of course, we're excited about the science, the, pro, the questions we're asking, but also the people we're training. So that's the first priority. One wants to make sure that the, that uh, nobody, if at all possible, nobody gets left hanging uh, because the, the lab disappeared, right? And so that means that the process of funds should be enough funds available uh, but that those funds decline in a way that is not a what we call a, a cliff. You know, go along and then all of a sudden there's a dead end, an end and there's a cliff and everybody falls off the cliff. Rather, it's a it's a soft landing, right? So you might I had I might have had a lab of fifteen people and I knew that I had to stop recruiting new people, accepting new people into my lab already five years before I closed it because uh, you know they're going to take three or so years. To, to, to do their postdoctoral training. So that was very important, advanced planning in shrinking down or, or uh, the downsizing the lab to be in, uh, in uh, accordance to decreasing funding. Because as I told you before, the grants go in five-year periods. I had several NIH grants, so I had to stop renewing them and concomitant with that stopping of the renewal, not get any more people and already the last couple of people that I accepted were very clearly you bring your own funds but you must know that two years after entrance there will be no more lab so that the, even at the level of the last people that I accepted they they needed now to know there was a an end date and uh, even with that advanced planning I had a couple of people who you know had to wait six months after the lab closed and and but that really is, is, is key. The advanced planning in terms of the people that you are training. You, you, cannot, you cannot hide it from, from the people. Uh, and, and all of a sudden say, well, you know, in my mind, I've been uh, thinking about this, but I didn't want to tell you guys because I don't want to surprise you. And now I'm going to surprise you. I'm gone, right? That, that's just horrible. So that's a huge, huge part, uh, advanced planning. Seven years in advance, I was beginning to think about it. Five years in advance, I was already taking active steps towards it. 
Okay, so what about when it comes to writing papers and writing up the results? Because I imagine during those five years before you retired, you were still, you know, doing research that needed writing up and publishing. Did it yeah, come yeah, yeah. to a stage where you, you know, last day was the last paper you handed in? Or was it like you had to do, still do some writing no, and yeah. publishing after? It, 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 it's a fascinating question. And it's, of course, it progresses down. And, 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 as fewer people were in the lab, fewer papers came out. So the writing continued, but of course it went down in amount. What ramped up, of course, was my involvement with the blog. Because I enjoy writing, and so as I was reducing in writing scientific papers, uh, I was increasing, uh, uh, let's say, research papers. I was increasing in the number of opinion papers that I was writing, and papers that uh, that had to do with the blogging, and papers that had to do with perspectives and reviews, etc. So that has that has continued. Although also it's you know like say I don't I don't write fifteen papers a year anymore. Okay, understood. <laughs> and then what about all the equipment in the lab? Um, what ah. what happens to that? Do you sell it off bit by bit? Do you give it to the university? Do you donate it to somebody else? Like what what does what happens to all of that? Yeah, that that is interesting and and it's an important point in terms of the infrastructure of a lab and it depends from lab to lab. But uh, the, the United States system is that the equipment belongs to the university. And then it depends on, uh, on uh, the university decision what to do with it. So, so big pieces of equipment, many of them, you know, I had had for 25, 30 years. So they, pro they were probably <laughs> junked, <laughs> you know, rusty water bath, things like that. Uh, some of the other things were already in a common core. Uh, for example, one huge piece of equipment uh, that is very useful across the disciplines are minus 80 freezers. So, of course, uh, I had to I had to deal with that, and and uh, those immediately get taken over by others because there, there's a need. So, there's some pieces of equipment that are immediately taken up by others. Um, in other cases, some things I'm th I'm sure that Harvard ended up throwing throwing out because it was just uh, the way it is. One thing that is interesting is that it's not an equipment but the resource is that my lab had a, a, a collection over the years of over 10,000 bacterial strains, which is a great resource. And uh, that actually, you know, provided some logistic problems. Uh, how do you manage strains that, uh, you know, there are issues about material transfers, et cetera. And so <laughs> we managed <laughs> to, to work it out. So the strain is the collection is still around and people can still get strains from the all of the publications and the collections that we've made so i think that's a really important resource uh and we need to have a good way to continue it because uh, eventually people stop asking for them but uh, that takes several decades and and if people know that it's still around you know even when i was working i was getting requests for stuff that i had made when i was a graduate student so so um that's important that has not be lost and those resources then, do they belong to you or do they belong to the university? They belong to the university, but the university doesn't want to deal with them, you know, the management. So I had to go through the process of transferring it. Yeah, yeah. Constanza Bonifer, an emeritus professor of haematology at the University of Birmingham in the UK and an honorary professor at the University of Melbourne in Australia, retired from academia and closed her lab at Birmingham University at the end of 2023. Like Vincent Sutter told us about the situation in Belgium, the same is true in the UK. Any equipment bought by the group belongs to the university, so it's not up to the retiring PI what happens with it. But in Constance's case, some of the materials and equipment went to her staff. And also staff who left and set up their own shop, they took whatever they needed. We had a lot of samples from, um, from leukaemia patients. And that was handed over to, uh, um, that's not hazardous. It is just, uh, this was, the ethics was transferred to somebody else, um, to a member of staff who was carrying on some of the project together with the clinician at, at, in Birmingham. And uh, um, this, the project was also taken over. So it was all done by the book, basically. They had freezers and freezers full of, of, of DNA fragments and plasmids and 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 restriction enzymes, you know, all bought from companies, and some something people sort of used some of these materials. So we distributed whatever anybody wanted, and some staff took it with them. 
and they, they set up, the, which helps them to set up their own lab. And they could all take some equipment with them if they wanted to. Our institute's director was very generous in that respect. But Constanza says that another thing that retiring professors need to consider when closing a laboratory is what to do with their data. We, we generated a lot of data as well, which were all archived. The lab books are archived and they have to be archived for about 10 years or 20 years almost in some cases. All the published, the data for published paper are all deposited in public repositories. If you publish things, you, 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 you're you still are liable to sort of scrutiny. And, and if anybody who reads one of our papers comes across anything that they want to query, I have to be able to answer the question and show that our experiment was done correctly. And uh, I, I can, we can get access to it if we need to. Well, I hope not, <laughs> because we were always very careful. Not all materials that are left behind are harmless or easy to dispose of. The University of California, Los Angeles, has a lab closeout checklist document that retiring PIs can refer to. According to chemistry professor Craig Merlick, who is also the executive director of the University of California Center for Laboratory Safety, this document deals with what should be done with the materials in the lab. We decide, I decided to create the letter so that we have you know, a policy in place, but also guidelines for faculty. So it turns out that this uh, need is actually across every research university. So whether it's UCLA or other universities in the United States or, or the United Kingdom, the, the issue of what happens with materials and potentially in, in, in particular hazardous materials, what happens to them when faculty close down their labs is a, a international issue. And so um, I decided that by being proactive, we can hopefully avoid, um, you know, issues or challenges down the line. Craig shared some stories of what these challenges might look like. For example, one university had a lab that was closing down as the PI was retiring. And as part of the laboratory, there was a piece of apparatus that had a large quantity of mercury inside it. The professor retired and shut down, but the this apparatus at another institution um, was sort of put in a closet. And then some years later... Uh, a custodian was was told, oh, clean out that closet. So this custodian started pulling things out and throwing it in the dumpster. And it turns out that they didn't see the hazard of this mercury-filled glass object. And so the, it broke when they were throwing it into the dumpster. And so it they ended up spilling the mercury on the ground and then into the dumpster. So a dumpster is like, you know, six feet by six feet by six feet steel container. Um, had mercury contamination, um, all because, you know, someone retired and left behind this apparatus that was stuck in a closet. And then a custodian, you know, was asked to clean out the closet years later. So they it ended up that they had to clean up the, the ground area around the dumpster, but the dumpster itself, um, they ended up just wrapping up the whole dumpster, six feet by six feet by six feet steel box with all the trash in it. And they took it out and they buried it in a hazardous waste site, the entire thing. So to avoid expensive mistakes like this, Craig wrote the checklist because there are many potentially hazardous materials that can be left behind. So what does this checklist look like? And so the checklist is a, is a list of all the things that need to be taken care of when a professor is shutting down their lab. So not only chemicals, but also radioactive materials, uh, biological materials, gases, um, if they have animals in a vivarium, um, all these things need to be taken care of as a professor is preparing to, to shut down their laboratory. And if things are not taken care of, then that's when we have to call in our environmental health and safety. They have limited resources. Uh, an example of something that could be challenging um, is an unknown material. So suppose there's a, a, a vial with a white solid in it. And if the, if that's left behind, what does the university do <laughs> with that white solid? Um, if if we have to dispose of it as an unknown material, um, environmental health and safety can contract with an outside contractor, and it can cost literally a, you know a couple hundred dollars 
per bottle to dispose of an unknown material. So basically by being proactive, we can try to avoid the situations like that where there could be significant costs uh, to the university. Carol Shoshka-Suisse, a professor emeritus at New York University, retired from scientific research and closed her lab in 2015. It was an earlier retirement from academic research than she had planned because funding had dried up, which meant that she didn't have the luxury of planning five years in advance like Roberto Coulter. Projects were finished, papers were written. Essential reagents that were not available anywhere else I maintained in a freezer. But all of the other things in the freezer that were, you know, just working supplies um, or were readily available anywhere else um, were uh, discarded and uh, appropriately discarded. Uh, you know, I gave away my equipment um, and, um, and, and um, you know, basically that's uh, what I had to do. And uh, and in most universities, there is a shortage of space. And so there, nature pours a vacuum and the uh, labs were immediately um, you know, taken over uh, by, by other people who needed to expand their space. And one thing I found when I did close the lab was my stress level was tremendously reduced. I didn't have to worry about writing grants anymore. I didn't have to worry about supporting the people in the lab anymore. I didn't have to worry about getting the next paper published because um, I needed it to maintain the this you know the string of papers. Now, if I want to publish a um, you know an opinion piece, I can write it and publish it. But um, I found it tr uh, a tremendous relief not to have the responsibility of being the PI anymore. And it enabled me to enjoy so much more of my life. In the final episode of this series, we're sharing a little bit about the tension that exists between younger and older generations in academia, as well as why some people believe that the older generations of scientists shouldn't be set aside once they hit retirement, but that they can be of great value to the universities and their students. And finally, I'll share a story about a woman who became a scientist once she retired from a career as a teacher. Thanks for listening. I'm Julie Gould.